Hey everybody, it's Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network. Welcome to my bedroom for what is our final B plus keynote. I could not be more delighted to be closing out uh, talking about the thinking place where we began, which is thinking about community and how communication really does move at the speed of trust. That's been a lesson I think we've been learning over the last couple of years. We listen to, we heed the words that we pay attention to, we look for folks that we uh, we have a relationship with, that we are in community with. And so that is increasingly going to be a charge that falls on all of us who do communications work, foundations and nonprofits. It's not just the words and the images, but really bringing people together so they can receive them, they can hear them, they can share them. And so that's, uh, that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about today with Kevin Wynn, who's with us. But before we do that, a little bit of housekeeping, and, and if we can, just heeding back to some of the practices we've developed over the last all too many months. Where are we at? Month nine now, gang? One thing we have done that's really wonderful is we've checked in with each other. So if we could, before we get underway, if you'll go down into the chat and just follow me, I'm gonna be slow here. Y'all know this by now, I'm a slow typer. But if you go into the chat button, it looks like a big word bubble at the bottom of your screen. Take your finger or your cursor, whatever you use to manipulate your computer. Why don't we all go down in there and just take a moment to say hello. And, and before you do that, if you would, just make sure it should probably say uh, you're talking to everyone or might say all panelists and attendees. But either way, if you would just type in your name, where you're coming in from, and that idea that we've borrowed from Professor Brene Brown down at the University of Houston, and that is the two word check-in. So in two words, how are you doing right now? And so I'll just join you, kind of kick things off. Hi, it's Sean, uh, excited and uh, who we got in here? There's Jade. How are you? Excited and thankful. And Amy Levner, another friend of ours in the DC area. Tired and grateful. That is a common way to be just about now as we hit the holiday season. Who else is here? Melinda coming in from Montana. Nice to see you virtually anyway, my friend. Motivated and hopeful. Glad to have you with us. Jay, hey, from Chicago. Nice to see you, my friend. Eager and hungry. And thank you for all y'all did today. They just came off of a wonderful event talking about racial equity. Uh, at Com Network Local Chicago, which is great. Susan's with us as well. Grateful and energized. Kevin's here, obviously in Brooklyn where it's snowing just a little bit. Steady and breathing, it's a good way to be. So everybody else, if you would, Dana, how you are? How you doing coming in from San Diego? Hungry and happy. And if the rest of us could borrow your weather, send it our way, we'd be happy to have it. I know Kevin's sitting in the middle of the beginnings of a snowstorm up there in Brooklyn. So we're gonna bring him in in just a quick minute, but Rachel, just come on in here, gang. Let's talk to each other. We'll throw some chats, uh, links into the chat along the way. And of course, feel free to be in community with one another, talking to one another. Of course, the span of this next 45 minutes, an hour that we've got with Kevin. All right. So with that in mind, also want to just flag for you something that we are proud to have made our practice in 2020. And I'm a little ashamed we didn't get to it until now. And that is we are offering a little bit more uh, greater accessibility. And so if you're interested and you have need of or just want to have the benefit of some closed captioning, we want to say thanks to Michelle, who's doing that for us. You can find closed captioning down at the bottom of your screen. And our friend Marva, who's with us throughout V in the last couple of months, she's with us as well. So you'll be able to see her if you have need for ASL interpretation services, you'll find her. You can actually pin that camera up so you can keep an eye on her throughout the hour. And I promise to try to talk slow to make it easy on Michelle and Marva. All right, so with that, hey, Liz, how you doing? Fire it up and chilly, because yeah, it's a little bit chilly in DC. We got a hint of the snow that, that Kevin's about to see. Uh, also behind the scenes, my colleague, Tristan Mahabir, Mr. T, if you would, advanced slides. He's gonna be helping us for the next little while. So let's just tell you the couple of slides. One thing we wanna just let you know, as we're winding down V, or the last content piece of V today, uh, we will have replays, as we have now for the last couple of months, available through the portal that we built for Com Network V. That's comnetworkvirtual.org. You've gotten a password. Should you need it again from us, just shout out. Reach, send me an email. We'll get you hooked up with that. But everything that we made together is up online and available for you. And a lot of it now is actually migrated. The V portions of stuff is migrated over onto YouTube, so you're welcome to share that as well. All right, Mr. T, if we can, take it forward. Com Network V. So here's the slide we're going to sit on for the next little bit. It's my great honor and pleasure to uh, invite now to join us, Kevin Wynn. Kevin has been behind the scenes helping us design and build V+, uh, and, and he has been incredibly helpful in that process. If you've been working with where you are a community ambassador, he doesn't need much of a, an invitation to you because you've seen the, the handiwork that he's provided through helping us all think through how we might bring people together. But Kevin, thank you for coming in today. Abigail, while you're in the chat, and Lamont, nice to see you both. Thanks for being with us. Kevin, nice to see you. I know we got to chit-chat a little bit before 
uh, before we joined everybody here. You want to tell us what's before I start the question, kind of how you got on this journey <laughs> and the work that you're doing. Do you want to explain to us what's behind the scene here? Because you and I were just talking about Dune. You apparently set a land speed record for finishing that book. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, just my virtual ba this is virtual background. You can tell by if I cover my camera, it's like I disappear. Boom. Um, <laughs> yeah, behind me is a uh, is just a, a, a photo of uh, one of the first bookstores that. Uh, a book that I published last year was put into. It's books actually in Singapore. Um, and I got to write this book with my amazing partners called Get Together. Um, it's a guidebook on how to build a community with your people. And above it is a, a large collection of Dune, which I read for the first time four weeks ago in a couple of days. And it was a wonderful, you know, dystopian escape that I just escaped into for a short period of time. Sometimes which is we something need that. we all need in 2020 so <laughs> yeah. for a book i guess we just got a recommendation which is a good place to start and speaking of book recommendations thank you so much for the gift of this book which uh the team tristan and carrie yabby kareem and i have been looking at and honored as well it's been incredibly helpful and so commend it to everybody if you're a community ambassador we actually got to share these out with everybody so community ambassadors for comnet v got a copy of this it's a wonderful book and rather than just holding it up and showing it to everybody kevin can i ask you this was a result of a long journey maybe the question yeah. becomes how did you finally end up with this book being published and sitting in that beautiful screen behind you how did you get there why do you care so much about building community and maybe you could share with us sort of your story and your journey about how we got here how we find yeah. this conversation today the story of my work and where I'm at right now really starts with the story of my family. You know, if, if I go back 45 years, I know Dana's calling in from San Diego. Uh, my dad landed in uh, Camp Pendleton in San Diego. My mom simultaneously landed in Arkansas as Vietnamese war refugees in 1975. And, you know, you can imagine my father walking off with like a thin t-shirt saying, this is the coldest I have ever been in my entire life as he arrived in San Diego. Growing up, I, I saw them kind of fall in and out of social communities and social groups that they were a part of from, you know, being sponsored by these church families in Texas and really being surrounded by a group of people to, you know, following opportunities elsewhere that led them to feel more isolated. And, you know, this, this comes up to me starting to grow up in Colorado, going you know, to a predominantly white school. At some point, I was referred to as the OA, which was the original Asian because I was the only one. And I believe it made me just a bit more uh, conscious about the people side of things. You know, uh, when I was interacting with people, when I wasn't, when I felt like a part of something and when I wasn't. And through this, one of my first loves became organizing. It became organizing activities. It was the school dances, it was the volunteer, you know, events. It was the canned food drives. And to me, that was a way of almost inserting myself into the interaction. If I wasn't sure if I would be invited, if I wasn't sure I, I really fit in at the time, it was a way to, you know, be a part of that process. Uh, and that theme really just stuck with me through doing my master's degree in mechanical engineering. I was spending just as much time producing large events and concerts and movie screenings on campus to uh, starting my career as producing, uh, producing large scale conferences, kind of like what you do with V plus, as well as uh, building out this chapter based uh, organization called Creative Mornings, which hosts uh, events and, and uh, lectures for the creative community. In, in 2014, I, there was a pivotal moment for me. Uh, two women named Jess Johnson and Brie Ferrigno were starting a professional women's network um, called Changemaker Chats. And they, you know, they just started this group in New York to discuss the good, bad, and ugly of navigating their careers. And they came you know, seeking some sort of uh, advice, some guidance on how to build out their community. And you know, in, our, in my book, Get Together, which I wrote you know, four years later, we define a community as simply a group of people who keep coming together over something they care about. And 2014, Kevin, in that moment, realized you know, there's a lot of people that care about a lot of different things. This isn't just about me and you know, the kids at my school, this isn't just about my parents and the, the people that are supporting them. It's just not, it's not just about uh, the creative world, which I was helping organize at the time. There are a lot of people that care about a lot of different things. And 
you know, uh, and there are leaders that step up in certain instances to do something about it, to uh, put the pieces in place to kind of, you know, spark the fire just to start um, a group and, and, and really begin to rally other people. Um, and so with, with that, my mind kind of opened and I would join forces with, you know, my current business partners, my co-authors, uh, Bailey Richardson and Kai Amorsoto. We would start this company called People and Company with this hunch that maybe the three of us could bring some value to the world by helping individuals and organizations better break down how they can bring people together. You know, communities feel magical, but they don't come together by magic. What are those, what are those steps that are involved? You know, how do you try to make smart bets to do it and not hope that you're just, you know, creating the space that organic things happen, please, please. Um, and we can get more into, you know, the work we do as uh, a strategy partner and some of the research we do, like the book. But back to your question of, you know, why I care. In short, you know, whoever you're focused on right now, whether this you're, you're thinking about an external audience, you know, as a communications professional, or you think about your internal team, or you just think about your personal life. I, I have this hunch that there's more that we can do together. You know, we don't need to reduce them to an audience. You know, alone, we are limited. With others, we extend our capacity. And if we start asking ourselves, you know, what does it look like if I'm actually serving a community, a group of people that would come together, keep coming together over something they care about? You know, what does, what does my work look like? And, and what is possible if we do so? Um, and I think a lot is possible. So that's me. And that is awesome and a beautiful thing. But I'm struck by the fact that you, you, you come from a, I suppose, engineering is a science or math based background. <laughs> You're a STEM kid, but, but, but you've stumbled upon, and I don't want to overemphasize this, but it seems to me you believe nothing happens without the community piece coming first, or that that is a really necessary ingredient. And I'll editorialize here, which is I think a lot of people walk past that piece. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could talk to me about. Is that true? Is that observation true? That lots of people just assume community and then think about how to leverage community without the doing the actual community building work? Is that true? And if so, what, what do we need to do to change that sort of narrative or belief that many people have, which is that it's just a, a happy accident that occurs on your way to a better tomorrow? I'll first call out that the word community is sufficiently ambiguous, you know, and it, it's getting thrown around in so many different ways from a euphemism for, you know, by large audience or user base. It's also thrown around as, you know, a sense of community. It's, you think about like social groups you're a part of, if you, you know, uh, if, if you play basketball or something else. Um, and, and, you know, my engineering lizard brain meat likes to kind of very quickly go past a, a philosophical discussion on like what is community and the meaning of community and very quickly into all right who are you bringing together why are they coming together and what are they going to do together because that's that's what this is about we we communities can go by many names you know from uh, uh you know your your networks to your social groups to that you know that erg at work to all these sorts of things and what it's really about is you know uh, uh, if you, what it's really about is bringing together a group of people to go do something together. So I, and this might be my kind of engineering bias, but, um, I, I, I'm more fascinated by, cause you now how do you put the pieces in place? What are the inputs and outputs? How do you create the right structure? So, um, people can start to, you know, work together to interact and do more and accomplish more together. So, so maybe I'm trying to take you to an ethereal place, but you're reminding me that there's a lot of mechanics, but, but it's true, yeah. right? I mean, ultimately what we're talking about is a, some kind of construct that requires actually foundational pieces and structure in place in order to, I guess, sustain itself, so survive and ultimately maybe thrive. And then to your point, do some good stuff together. Even if that's just getting the folks together to go to that ball game someday in the future, inshallah, yeah. when, when this pandemic has passed us and we're able to be a little bit more mobile. Um, how do you go about, so now I'm going to ask you the engineering question then, how do you build community? How do you go about mm -hmm. getting after this work? How do you need to be thinking about it? What kinds of skills do you need to have? What's yeah. the magic beans that you need to bring into the process? Yeah. I'll tell a story to kind of illustrate. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the organizations that 
you know, I've gotten to work with that we've gotten to work with is uh, the EdCamp Foundation. It's an education focused organization. So uh, about, oh, must be between five and 10 years ago, there were, uh, uh, I think, five teachers, five-ish teachers within the Philadelphia area that really disliked how professional development was being done within their schools. You know, at, at its worst, they felt like they were being uh, forced to sit through, you know, PowerPoint presentations from so-called experts who really didn't understand the needs of the classroom. And they looked at each other and said, I, I think we can do this better with just ourselves if we were teaching each other. So in, inspired by some other kind of uh, events and camps that have existed, they uh, put this call out to say, hey, we're hosting an ed camp on Saturday. And what it involves is uh, uh, you can be a an edu any type of educator, whether it's elementary school, middle school, high school, public, private, charter, you're welcome. We're going to meet up at the school. There will be no set agenda. Um, and we will uh, uh, suggest topics to discuss for the day that we really want to get into, whether it's teaching science to introverts, whether it's social justice in the classroom, um, whether it's uh, some new type of technology uh, or tool that people are interested in using. And we, you know, who we will lead the sessions, individuals lead the sessions, and you will be able to walk into or walk out of any session you find valuable for the day. They had 100 educators immediately show up at the first one. Um, and if you fast forward, some of those educators walked away and said, wow, that was the best day of professional development I've gotten in my 20 year career. And it wow. didn't involve any so called expert coming. And it was actually just having the space to discuss what we really needed to discuss, what I really wanted to discuss with other teachers. Uh, the Gates Foundation would eventually become a, you know, a sponsor of the EdCamp Foundation. And today, ed, thousands of EdCamps have happened around the world in all 50 states and over 50 countries. And it started with this core group of teachers. So you ask, you know, how do you start a community? I think there are three key questions to go about this. One, who do you want to bring together? Two, why are you going to come together? And three, what are you going to do together? Uh, and, and, and I say this because I think people jump almost immediately to the what sometimes, or they'll have like a, a, a selfish why involved. It's like, oh, I, I want to you know, increase X metric at my company. But really, it starts with who. Who do you care about right now? Who is your work focused on? Who are you investing in? And for those educators, it was other educators who, were, uh, who weren't who were feeling the professional development they were getting right now, believing something was better. And as far as why they would get together, probably a blend of both skill, develop, skill development and an actually empowering, empowering setting. You know, they're going every day having to answer to kind of, uh, you know, uh, the state telling them what to do, the principal telling them what to do, administration telling them what to do, and now like other non-educators telling them what to do. So what does empowering skill development look like? You know, that's why that was their original hunch. And then they cited on, all right, well, there's, there's no substitute for action right now. There's no substitute for actually doing something together. And in this case, they decided to host an unconference, an event that has kind of a very fluid, uh, participatory vibe where they could have teachers teach each other and provide empowering skill development. And based on the timing and this group of people, it, it really resonated. Um, and people wanted to take this and make it their own and bring it to other cities and bring it to Brooklyn and bring it to, you know, uh, Ukraine and all over. Uh, and, and to me, that's, uh, I like the idea of, bringing just a little bit more structure to how we approach making the best bets we can to start a community, start a group of people that are coming together to realize a certain purpose. I think it believes it starts with just who, why, and what. Pretty simple stuff, but incredibly powerful. And no, uh, no surprise here to find that there's echoes of that in the net, in the, uh, in the network's origin story, which 40 years ago was, a few folks gathering at the back of somebody else's conference didn't want to talk mm -hmm. about whatever was on the agenda at the front of the room. They wanted to talk about their work and their craft, maybe a little bit of gossip. And, and it's grown now to the point where there's, you know, thousands of people across the globe who are part of this organization. 
and really, I think I always had to use the word organization because it is a community. It's people turning up for one another. Yep. Maybe we could pivot to another professional experience, which was, I think, had a profound impact on you. Or I don't want to be so presumptuous. Maybe you'll tell us how it had a profound impact. Yeah. And that's your work at Creative Mornings, which has mm -hmm. been a model for those of us at the network and a lot of us who are trying to bring people together to enhance and improve their work. Can you talk a little about what that story looked like? How did you end up working for Creative Mornings? Again, with that background in engineering, how did that all come together for you? And, and what are you most proud of from that experience? What do you take away from it? Yeah. If you, if you teleport me back to starting to work at Creative Mornings, it, it, was, it was my first job and I was taking multiple jobs, but it was you know one of my first jobs out of college. Um, I had this and you were employee number one, right? I was employee number one. Uh, maybe it's a bit indulgent, but I, you know, I, I had this, if my parents had a survivor mindset when they came to this country, I had this mindset of, wow, they gave me a privilege and a platform to like, to thrive, to do something that, you know, that I really find is like purposeful, meaningful, interesting. Not that it's going to be easy, but like that. And I, had and I was looking for an opportunity that somehow blended all of these different cakes that I was trying to eat at once, right? Blended both being pretty like process oriented and operational. That's kind of the engineering side. Um, and then also loving like live human experiences and bringing people together and this like entrepreneurial scratch. Um, and through a series of, you know, cold emails and introductions. I was eventually just put in touch with Tina Roth Eisenberg, who is the creator, the founder of Creative Mornings in New York City. I was at school at uh, UC Berkeley at the time. And she was at this point where she had started a creative meetup um, where, you know, she is a, uh, of a web and graphic design by trade and felt like there are all these silos within the creative industry. Uh, and this was back in probably a few years before I met her. So this is probably back in about 2008. Um, and believe, you know, what would it be like if uh, who we brought together like a wide swath of creatives that still that, you know, why for inspiration and what at some sort of like live lecture or gathering. Um, and she started this kind of creative mornings meetup series out of her studio space in New York. And it grew and it grew and it eventually had hundreds of people attending. And there was like another a city or two that like, you know, an attendee from here would move somewhere else. And they say, yo, can I start this chapter? And she was looking at that moment for a, um, a person who had an entrepreneurial itch with a process-oriented operational mind that also loved um, uh, you know, live experiences and bringing people together to help her scale it, to help her pass the torch to new organizers. And uh, my ex experience there, which was, yeah, it was formative. It, was, it showed me Kind of the the power of building a sandbox for other people just to enable them to do more of what they wanted to do um, i got to uh, uh inherit you know a, a a an inbox full of people saying hey can i bring creative mornings to my city um and i interviewed and onboarded and created an application process for the first you know uh, 50 years, I was interviewing them all myself for the first 50 or so chapters and putting the systems in place, you know, those resources, those assets, the legal agreement, what does it mean to be an organizer um, to eventually and eventually building a small staff that would highlight sort of the, the content, the lessons that were coming out of all of these different cities up until we got we passed 100 cities. So you imagine today it's 200 and over 220 cities that every single month there is a uh, an event uh, celebrating the local creative community with, uh, it always happens on Friday mornings and uh, one creative person is kind of sharing their, their journey, their process um, at a time. And it was, yeah, to the, the, I think the key point here for me is it, it taught me that how much was possible. I mean, the team was small at headquarters, right? It was me and the small team I built. How much is possible when you, really channel people's like energy. It's like, you can't fake the funk. Like I couldn't make those people like seek out the need for more inspiration. Like that was the, you know, that was what they wanted and needed more of. And I got to see what's, what happens when you create the tools and the space that enables them to do more of it and also organize for others. And now, so from 2008, we're now in 2020, 12 years later, hundreds of chapters of Creative Mornings, or maybe a way to think about it is once a month on a Friday, there are 200 hours 
of people, you know, separately in different yeah. parts. Of Around the world. a common theme now too. There's like a global theme, whether it's food or water or loneliness. And so what does that feel like now? Like, can you quantify using your kind of engineer's brain? Like what's the impact or the meaning of all of that when it was for a period of time, just a series of inquiries mm. on, on an email? Mm. After, after I uh, left Creed Mornings um, in 2015, I traveled and spent some time on the sofas of, you know, of Ross Drakes, who runs the Johannesburg chapter, and Emma, who runs, uh, who's part of the Buenos Aires chapter. And what struck me was two words, uh, shower time. <laughs> it's like the things I think about in the shower are sort of the things that either are like really stressing me out or the things that are really building me up, right? They are the things that I am dwelling on or dreaming on. And when I spent time, I was not, it's not showering with the folks, but when I was spending time with them, I, I, I realized sort of the, the unquantifiable um, amount of kind of brain energy and meaning that this leadership role meant for those leaders. And I think we've, we've felt that at certain times, the power of like finding the right role that enables you, that gives you a little bit of that structure and confidence to do something that you didn't think was possible, whether it's like someone saying, Hey, you're now the, you know, you're now the, the secretary for our, for our club, or, you know, you are the, you know, you are the, 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 uh, uh, the Asian American, like employee resource group leader, how that almost, you know, uh, takes, takes over and provides this, uh, this platform for you to start dreaming on. And, and, you know, if you ask me to think about what it means to me, that that was a lesson. Like I wanted to work on things from then on. And I wanted to help other people work on their things that were going to, you know, um, create those opportunities for others. I, I believe great leaders go create more leaders. And we, I got to see what it meant to create leaders. And that's, in that experience. And I'm, I guess I'm hell bent on helping more leaders create more leaders in their work. No, I think that is very much kind of how I think, I hope all of us on the board and the, and the staff, the network think about it is one of our great opportunities is to build not just our field, but to build leaders in our field. And just the crazy things that can happen when you, when you empower, you give people a little bit of power or permission, maybe is really what we're in the business of doing, just giving people permission to go take some power and build something and see the wonderful effects that that can have. I wonder if, as a piece of that, what are some of the challenges or dangers that you can run into potentially as you're thinking about these things? Because it's not always sunshine and daisies. There mm -hmm. are going to be some challenges as you're doing these things. What are some of the things that you encounter that you think of sort of lessons learned or Gosh, I wish I'd known that before I stepped in that particular spot. Yeah. Takeaways, particularly around creative mornings or more broadly around community building. Yeah. Well, the, the challenge of this year is adapting. <laughs> you know, I don't need to tell any of you that. Um, the challenge of this year is adapting and when I think about the, uh, the organizations that we're you know, advisors to or the community leaders I get to take office hours with or you know, the friends who are putting on things, um, one challenge is the world shifting. And if a community is about who you're bringing together and community starts with who you're going to bring together and why they're going to come together, what is the purpose of this group and then what they're going to do together, uh, you know, this year with the pandemic, we've seen for some groups like the what is no longer an option, right? The in-person ed camp, that 400 person unconference in Newark, New Jersey that I went to last year with those amazing educators, that can't happen the same way, right? Rules have shifted. The world has shifted. Or, um, you know, there was a, uh, I was talking to an organizer who put on a uh, who would put on like this monthly party around like building solidarity among their group. And it just felt like with the pandemic interest shifted, you know, the needs for the, the, the group of people they cared about did not change, but what those group, what those people needed changed. They no longer needed sort of like a celebration of solidarity. They needed something else um, in this time. So, you know, 
one one story I have that kind of brings us to life to think about the challenges and how to navigate them is a um, a group called the Dinner Party. So there's an organization that's called the Dinner Party. I think if you look up the dinnerparty.org or you can check out their story on our podcast. Um, was started by uh, uh, two young women who lost loved ones um, at a young age, you know, lost parents, um, lost family members at a young age. And um, as, you know, 20 and 30 somethings, they were looking for a space to transform kind of their life after loss. You know, what, what happens now? And they've been doing this work for almost a decade. And they began hosting these dinners to provide a space in, in cities where, people who are part of the club that no one wants to be a part of can um, find some support and guidance in a non-judgmental space. And with the pandemic, you know, what they do, in-person dinners, like that, that had to change. But why they existed, you know, the purpose all of a sudden became even more heightened and urgent. And frankly, more people in their network were dealing with more people in their lives were dealing with losing a loved one. So suddenly the needs like uh, has sort of skyrocketed in some ways and shifted in form a bit while what they do has been, um, has been constrained. And so they've had to adapt and shift. And, and it wasn't as simple as like, oh, we went, we went virtual, right? We hosted like Zoom dinners and they, they tried that. And there are some of those sort of gatherings happening. But as they started to listen to their group, um, they realized that what people were missing was a person to talk to kind of on this level, you know, to talk to on this level. And honestly, on a more specific level, the idea of not just losing someone in general, but, you know, losing a parent or losing a child or losing, you know, someone that you weren't able to see before they went, before they left. Um, and they decided to shift what they do and stand up sort of a one-on-one -on -one program, almost like a buddy or mentorship program where they would match people on even more specific criteria. So I think the, the lesson there of, of, of as far as like challenges people face, um, uh, oh, you know, uh, and, and the challenges people face is dealing with change. And I think the, the tip there, as far as like dealing with how the world shifts, because inevitably is going to, is back to that point of leadership, right? Like if you're gonna build a community, you can't build it for people, you gotta build it with people. If you wanna build a community, you gotta build, you can't build it for people, you need to build it with people. And in times of change, the best you can do is work with sort of the folks and hopefully you've created more leaders to start to troubleshoot and, you know, figure out like what's going to happen. And like Carla and Lennon did with the dinner party, it came back to understanding like, all right, who, who is who we serve? Like, are they still there? It's like, yes. Is what they need changed a little bit, even more heightened, but there's also a different form here. We need to go talk to them. And finally, uh, what do we do together? That's going to be informed differently. It's no longer these kind of larger groups all the time, but there needs to be more specific kind of one-on-one -on -one conversation that we facilitate. And so that actually brings me to a place that's very much lands in the communication space and that's listening. So if you're trying to build with people, obviously you need to have the questions that you want to ask, but then you need to be really open to that. The true deep listening where it's not, can I hear what I want to hear and plug it in? But yeah, how do I actually receive what you're saying so that it's meaningful and I have shared meaning with what you're after? You talked to me a little bit about how, how important listening is when you're thinking about building with or building for people, not building for, excuse me, building with people. Yeah, yeah. When I think about listening in the context of community building, another thing many things come to mind from listening to feedback about what your group is doing to listening to um, uh, your members and their needs. Uh, perhaps my, the one, the one point that I would dig into is the power of personal epiphanies. The, the beauty of, I think a lot of the types of communities we're talking about right now are organizations or organizations or groups where people aren't doing something just because of money, right? They are motivated for something else. You can't fake the funk. They are, they are showing up to the dinner party because um, they lost a family member like I did this year, you know? They are showing up because 
um, you know, they feel like the other people in their profession or in their sector, like aren't getting the resources or aren't getting the support or skill development they need. Um, and I think the, the approach to building with people is realizing that you need to help people kind of find their own way. And you're li not listening necessarily to do something for them or to just to cram them down some funnel so they, you know, move from awareness to act activity to sale, right? Uh, what you're trying to do is help them, you know, see, figure out and realize what they you know, are really want to do and capable of doing and then providing the right environment to do so. So, um, and this is, you know, how I approach my work and our work community building is really the orientation of, uh, you know, almost a coach that understands the power of a personal epiphany. There's just something so different from uh, uh, just feeling like you're being heard and that's going to be filed away, right? Or uh, just hearing advice from someone else when someone listens to you, but then also kind of reflects and helps you see, you know what, like I would really be excited to be a leader. I, I, you know, I'm, I do care about this right now. Like that's, that's so powerful. I think about the best mentors that I have had and they really help me reach my own sort of destinations and my own epiphanies. And, you know, Carla and Lennon aren't out there, you know, just convincing others to host other dinner parties. The founders of EdCamp are not, you know, uh, just listening to kind of feedback on, on what teachers need right now and filing it away. They are reacting to it and they are creating, you know, opportunities for those people to take action on them. So to me, it's, uh, it's, it's listening with the, with an ear for um, how do I help this person get where they get where they want to go. And it strikes me that, as you say that, that we oftentimes, you know, forget that like, there's a very powerful thing of just inviting people. You know, there's mm. this idea I learned a couple of years ago and I've, I've remained very, very taken with, which is that leadership is not a role. It's an activity. Yeah. But for a lot of people to take on that activity, they've, we've been taught, you know, what leadership looks like. It's this hierarchical thing or something. I mean, there's that wonderful book from someone who I guess probably lives just a couple of miles from you, Henry Timms uh, and Jeremy Hymans, who wrote that. Do you, do you know the book New Power? It's all about the idea of sort of the No, you mentioned it to me. You you put it on my reading list. I put it on your reading list. All right, well, I'm going to send you a copy after this. Is <laughs> Thank over. you. I'm a big believer in that we're actually, a lot of the work that you are doing and a lot of people are thinking about is all kind of coinciding with sort of a shifting that we're seeing in power dynamics broadly across the world. Some of that's because of technology. Some of that's just because the way we problem solve needs to shift, but that there seems to be this movement towards galvanizing lots of people and directing their activities, sometimes for just a moment or two, right? Yeah. Like maybe with a political campaign, but other times with EdCamp, recognizing that what's been provided by sort of this old power hierarchical structure, it's a little bit more kind of command and control, isn't actually scratching the itch. Yeah. And so it makes me think about like, how do you help people understand the opportunity that they have to lead, that they don't actually mm. have to wait for someone to roll up and hand them a gavel or a crown or whatever it might be, that it's actually mm. sometimes just that invitation. We could use your help. What do you think? Yeah. How, yeah. How, do you, how do you help people build that mindset? I believe community building is made up of progressive acts of collaboration. Right. Like perhaps you start by doing something for others. You know, you, you organize the first meeting, the first conference, the first, you know, collaborative resource y'all are going to work on. And then very quickly, you enable other people to participate in a meaningful way. Very quickly, then you, you, hand, you, you break off little pieces, chunks of responsibility and say, Hey, is this, you know, this seems like a good fit for you based on what I'm hearing about what you're interested in. And, you know, it's not hundred percent baked, but with you, it, you know, you could make it happen. Yeah. You know, what the, the story for me that comes to mind here is, um, you know, my, my friend, Nate Nichols, uh, he was telling me on the day that George Floyd was murdered, he woke up, um, and he was in tears with his wife. And he said, this is one of the first days I feel like, more people are starting to understand what it feels like to be me each day. And Nate, who um, is in the advertising industry, and he started an agency called Palette Group, 
uh, he had been, uh, his, his business had really like taken uh, a hit with the pandemic. So you do, if you run a creative agency and you do a lot of like in-person, like live production, um, that stuff was out the window. You know, all of his clients were gone. You know, the tens of thousands of dollars, the hundreds of thousands of dollars, they were gone. And he was like, how the hell are we going to navigate this time? And he started organizing people, right? He started organizing other freelancers and creatives within the advertising agents, advertising industry. And at this point in the story, um, after George Floyd's murder, he immediately uh, rallied a small group of people and said, um, the next summit we organize, the next sort of freelancer advertising summit we organize is going to be about allyship in action. It's going to be about you know, how, how are you taking an active role within the industry, within your company, within your team to do something about, you know, racial injustice, if you want to take, you know, an anti-racist stance and, you know, they, they organized their first virtual summit, something kind of similar to what you've done that had like 3000 people sign up for this like live session. I know a lot of people say they're zoomed out, but to me, when you really, when you really tap into something, when you tap into that elephant in the room that people really are like, want to discuss, when you really tap into something, you know. Um, And what's beautiful is very quickly, this became just something bigger than Nate. It became something bigger than Steffi. It became his wife. It became something bigger than even that core team of a couple other partners organizing this summit. You know, all of a sudden they were just, breaking off piece of pieces of what it means to start bringing people together around this topic. Right. And so we need, we need workshop leaders. We need producers. We need someone who's thinking about like that Slack group that's going to be happening afterwards. Maybe those people become moderators. Who's raising their hand right now. Who's showing up. Let's pay attention to who's showing up and let's help them understand a craft, a role, a leadership role, whether it's big or small that enables them to do more than they were doing before. You know, that gives them a bit of that, the right balance of structure and freedom to um, enable them to act more. So, you know, I, I, you asked, you know, how do you kind of uh, enable people to do this, to take on more? And I think the story of allyship in action comes to this idea of believing in that balance, believing in, hey, if people are really showing up and raising their hands, one thing we can do is define roles and very quickly just start breaking apart the work that needs to be done here um, and enabling others to do it and take it on and give them enough support. So they're, they're not going to flounder, but also enough of an opening so they can remix that, you know, they can bring their own vibe to it. They can bring their own interests um, to the table. What, as you try to reflect on this year and, and that wonderful story of the dinner table and how they've adapted on the whole, just sort of taking back, as, maybe it's just this time of year to sort of take stock a little bit, but, but as you reflect <laughs> yes, on, on what has been, I think, for all of us, an, an extraordinarily difficult year, a lot of turbulence, a lot of danger, a lot of damage. Do you leave the world from your perch, witnessing a lot of the kinds of activities that you've described? Do you feel more optimistic or pessimistic? Do you feel more enthusiastic about the future or are you a bit concerned based on all you've seen? Because we've seen incredible acts of kindness and inspiration and also quite a bit of cruelty. But where do you land on that ledger? Hmm. Is both okay? You know, it's yeah, like absolutely. The- <laughs> as long as you understand where, how, you, how you come to both and, and if yeah. there's a little bit of the scale tip in one way or the other, tell me how. how what, what is that? What, what is that phase change where you're both like a it's like uh, you know, liquid and gas simultaneously. Like, well, it's like your basic rule of polarities, right? <laughs> that, that seem to be opposed, happen to exist simultaneously, and yeah, it's the fact. Yeah, yeah. So, given what I've seen, optimistic, pessimistic. Um, I there's a part of me that um, feels uh, has felt, you know, personally, some of. Uh, has felt personally grief and grief with um, a number of community leaders where their, you know, the, where their plans got scrapped, where the the potential that they saw, you know, went away. You know, the person who is organizing the next incredibly large um, conference for the chronic illness community that was like really taking off. All of a sudden, those plans like kind of went out the window. Not to say that she's going to continue to serve them like through Chronicon, but there was a need to, you know, 
as a le- as a leader, there's only so much gusto that you have in the tank and you got to also take care of yourself or you can take care of others. The, the part that makes me optimistic is in a, I guess in a weird way is the, I believe that creativity thrives within constraints. Um, and in a time where there is an even, you know, there's, there's a lot of painful stuff going on. That means there are a lot of needs. There are a lot of even more important needs. Like we, we work and advise with an organization called Special X that um, is helping uh, parents raising kids with disabilities. You know, how do they find a blend of that urgent guidance and that emotional support as they're doing this, you know, this really hard thing. Um, and there is in so much more need right now. You think about like remote learning and uh, in this time, well, if you have, uh, if you're raising a kid with uh, disabilities, you, you're really trying to figure out school right now. You're really troubling school, right? Now, let alone if you don't have, you know, certain access to resources. So I am optimistic because I see people recognizing the needs. I see such clear constraints in perhaps people's time or bandwidth or the format of what they're able to do. And um, I believe that people are, 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 you know, are willing and brave enough and courage enough to go take that first step and go do something about it. You know, Jason Lembeck, the founder of Special X is saying, hey, I'm having to navigate this with my son, Noah, and there are other parents doing the same thing. And I'm going to go figure something out right now to do this. And to me that maybe it's less about optimistic about the impact we'll see. It's optimism around our empathy for other human beings. You know, it's like through that process of like seeing needs and feeling needs and doing something about it or supporting others that do something about it. I, you know, I I have to believe that our empathy for other humans is gets more real over time. I'm gonna now I'm gonna sort of flip a little bit to more of the practical tactical because there's an awful lot of that and it's yeah. more out of this book and I'm gonna ask you to tell us kind of the story of we we talked about what was one of your favorite stories and you said Surfrider and then, and many of the folks who have joined us know Chad Nelson who's the CEO there has been a big fan and friend to our, us over the years, um, but but beyond that if you're working in the communication space. Mm. How do you need to be, and maybe particularly if you're a little bit thinking like, I don't know how this community stuff fits into my daily, you know, I got to get that press release out, or I got to update the website. I have these tasks that have to be performed, which are necessary and important and advance the mission and purpose of our organization. But where does community fit into that? How does that, if you're working in a communication space, if you had a chance to just kind of talk through the screen at one person and explain to them why community is a piece of their work, what would you say to them? Can I flip it back to you first? I would rather remix and riff on this question. Yeah, like, please. As you, as you tee this up, you know, what, how do you feel like community fits into a communications, you know, professional's life and daily work? I'm going to take the deficit frame on that. I'm going to say a lot of us think of it as a tactic. Like, how can we leverage yeah. the community in order to get mm. to this great outcome, right? Whatever yeah. that may be. We want people to vote. We want people to participate in X, Y, or Z. We want people to write their content, whatever that outcome is, it's action oriented. But I, I got to believe that that's, that community that shows up and is reliable is sustained by something other than just those, those one-offs that you sometimes ask of them. You know, you gently say, yeah. there's something else that's sustaining it. And that to me feels like a task that actually does fall in a communication shop, that that is their responsibility to nurture, to do that listening piece. Yeah. So I guess I, I'll go back to you. How do you, how do you convince, what would you, what would be the case you would make for community building inside of a communication shop? How do you think about that as you're planning for 2021? Hmm. It would probably be the same thing I'd say to anyone in any position. If we're thinking about from a, you know, from a professional standpoint, from your work standpoint, um, what you do probably involves people. <laughs> it probably involves helping people, supporting people, getting people to, you know, contribute to something. And the lessons, whether or not you call it community, once again, what I'm saying is this is about a group of people who are going to keep coming together over what they care about. And that kind of 
power of their continual, you know, interaction and work together, whether they are sharing peer support, whether they are sharing best practices and tips, whether they are honing kind of their language with one another, um, that can be channeled to achieve things and accomplish things. And it's, it's this tightrope, right? Where it's this balance where you have to, it also really has to be in their interests. Um, you can't, this can't be one-sided. You're not telling people to get involved with it. So um, I would say if you're a communications professional, you probably are doing something that involves people. And, you know, are you asking yourself, uh, what would it look like? You know, can I do more with those people that I'm doing more? Can I do more with those people versus saying stuff at them or asking them for things? Can I create a bit more of a partnership, any, you know, loose, any sort of partnership with them and with them, with each other, that is going to help us accomplish our goals. You know, if you want advocates, and we talk about surf rider, if you want activists and advocates, one thing is you can have, you can, shout at a bunch of people and say, please, you know, advocate for that. Or you can go say, who am I looking for? I'm looking for people who care about the ocean, who care about the coastline right now, who would believe in advocating for this thing. And you can ask, you know, what, why, why would they come together? You know, what, what do they need more of right now? Do they, you know, do they need more local change in their communities? Do they need more fun in their lives? Do they need X, Y, or Z? And what could we do together that, helps us further like our common purpose, which would be to protect the world's like oceans, coastlines and beaches. Um, and so I, I think it's just, it comes down to a perspective shift of believing, you know, I can probably build with a few, build with people more than doing it for them or kind of asking it of them. Now, you know, your people where way better than I do. Once again, if you're talking about the audience or you know other people in the sector or your family or internal team members but going through this exercise of yeah who why what how does this how might i work with them a bit more to me is is kind of that golden thing to keep coming back to if you walk away with one thing today just be like kevin said what does it mean to like build with people not build for them just just how do i achieve this with others more than trying to do it for them or at them um that that's my one takeaway for today and that's a really different way of thinking about service right Rather than let me do for you, let me build with you. Yeah. Are there any other organizations we talked about, Surf Rider, but are there others that you can point to and go, gosh, you know, Creative Mornings, Surf Rider? Are there some other organizations that you might point to to say this, Oaks, as you're taking a little time towards the end of this year and reflecting about next year and how you might work differently? If this is a way of working that appeals to you, who might you look to as models? Hmm. Who, who else would I recommend? I mean, I'm such a big fan of the organizations that just to recap the ones I talked about, whether it's the EdCamp Foundation with educators, whether it's Creative Mornings with the Creative World, whether it's Special X with kind of a, the uh, raising, helping parents with kids with disabilities, allyship in action, what they're doing. Um, I guess as far as role models, I, maybe some, nothing's more powerful than something that's in your own life, right? It might be taking stock of, you know, what is a group that I'm a part of, if I have one, that has taken on more meaning for me in the past, you know, nine months than it did before? You know, what is one of the things that has kind of increased? Like I'm part of a, uh, a mastermind group, you know, a group of um, a couple entrepreneurial people. There's six of us that get together each month to, um, you know, share where we're at, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that group has talk about navigating changes, just like taking on more meaning, uh, in these past nine months. And I think the, I think the inspiration can come from like, well, where did that come from? What happened? Is, is there one person in that group that has actually like driven that forward? The one that is sending the emails, the one that's sending the invites, the one that's like creating the space, the one that identified those rules, like think about those leaders or those hand raisers in your life and, um, yeah, pay attention to them and ask yourself, you know, is that something that I want to do? Or is that just someone that I need to thank right now? Because they've shown up in a time that I wasn't ready to show up. It's almost a nice way to leave it. We're going to take one more question. And gang, if you have a question in the Q&A box, feel free. Otherwise, I'm going to continue to exercise the privilege. And that is, Kevin, as we we know that there appears to be vaccines that are served, they're being administered in mm. Britain and maybe a few other places now. Our expectation is that it'll start to occur in the United States maybe sometime after the turn of the year. 
but nothing is going to snap back and get solved immediately. We have and maybe one way the team and I are thinking about this in Fork HQ is we kind of just reached halftime or we're about at halftime. Yep. And there's that idea I was reading about if it was in the Times or the Post or something. I was reading about this idea of like third quarter fatigue. It, 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 hits, <laughs> it hits sports teams a lot. You've seen it, right? You're watching your favorite soccer team or whatever the sport is that you follow. And, and they come out in the third quarter and they're flat. They just, yeah. they, whatever, something happened. All of us are probably heading towards a little of that come January. And that's that's me just at another. Thanksgiving dinner that, that you described <laughs> me. I was, I was roasted more than the turkey. Please continue. <laughs> Knowing we have a long, unsteady, unstable road ahead. Any particular advice for folks based on mm -hmm. what you learned this year in, in leading, guiding, and helping to build some communities to mm -hmm. get us to the other side? Or to help us find our way to the other well, side. Well, I want all y'all's advice as well. <laughs> so I, I, I need it too. Mm. My mom is a uh, infection preventionist. 20 year career leading sort of the hospital protocols and how you deal with infectious diseases, um, where infections come from, preventing them. So March hits, she's working 12 hour days, seven days a week. And in kind of her darkest moment, I remember her saying, well, one, she's like, well, somehow I'm still really upbeat when she answered the phone for me. So I was like, all right, that's, that's my mom. That's where like, that's where the survivor um, is. She talked to me about how she was starting to uh, lean on others as um, she may have been the infection preventionist of, you know, the Aurora hospital in Colorado. Um, but she was, um, training and developing nurse, nurses to be, um, I can't remember the, 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 she comes up with these great acronyms. At first it was like COVID champion. Then she was like, no one wants to be a COVID, a champion of COVID. Um, but it was other nurses who were going to be um, infection prevention, uh, uh, almost like ambassadors or advocates. Like they could understand uh, everything, uh, what they needed to know, what my mom knew, so she could she was duplicating herself. And um, I don't know, when you ask this question of advice on how to deal, that's, I mean, that's the one thing that comes to mind around. It's like, uh, how, how can I lean on, lean on others in this moment? How can I, um, if, if I do not have the, um, you know, the, the presence or the energy to show up how I usually do, are there others that can, that if I invest a little bit of time, I can pass the torch to them and I can, can almost draft off of them like a cycling team um, because there's a chance they're going to need to draft off of you later. And it's, it's not a bad to draft, but you might need to teach those folks a little bit, coach them or, you know, give them that role in order to do so. Um, so yeah, build your champions. I love that. And I would let it lie there, but Carol and Emily have asked me to ask you. Yeah, last Carol Abrams. Can we, can we try to do it kind of Please. rapid lightning round of jeopardy? So Carol asks, do you have any thoughts about successful online communities? These are relationships that are online only. Maybe folks haven't had a chance to meet in real life. They didn't, or they didn't start in real life and they yep. won't be nurtured in real life. So truly virtual relationships. How do you, how do you make successful online communities? Yeah. So, so the, the get together system or methodology believes that, you know, communities feel magical. They don't come together by magic. And there's actually an order of operations to, start a community that can thrive. And obviously, you know, not everyone follows like steps one, two, three, four, five, six, then eight, nine, but there are some things that if you do earlier on are going to pay off like compound interest. And I think one of the mistakes that online communities make, I, and I also, I don't think the distinction of like online and offline community is as helpful. I think a lot of communities do things online and offline, um, but communities are primarily interacting online I think one of the mistakes that we make when we start them or, or try to keep them going is putting people in a, in a watering hole of some sort, putting people in a discussion space and hoping that interaction happens, hoping that those relationships build. And our uh, kind of my philosophy at people in co 
at People & Co. is uh, that after you kind of have a hunch about the purpose of the community, after you pinpoint your people, step two is to do something together. And then step three is to go get them talking. So one kind of tip or thought on successful online communities is asking yourself, you know, what are we actually doing together? What is the shared activity that is here? And this doesn't have to look like a, you know, 90 minute Zoom happy hour. It could be something that is, you know, whether folks are being paired up to have one-on-one -on -one conversations like a mentorship program, or if it is small group discussions, or it's, you know, we build a wiki together of resources or, you know, all sorts of formats for activities. But I ask, you know, what is that online community doing together beyond believing that they're just going to speak and talk with one another? Um, there are, I think there is a sliver of communities that's just purely discussion-based. Like that is really like what is about, I think you've maybe brushed up against some of these forums. It's just like always an only just like lively discussion. But I th think a large majority of the communities we hope will come to life online um, demand something else, which is a purposeful, participatory and repeatable shared activity. Um, that's what makes a good shared activity. Those are our three criteria in the book. You can remember it as pepper, but purposeful, like it, uh, it ladders back up to the purpose of your group. If it's really about empowering skill development, then like go figure out some activity that, you know, you're not leaving this up to chance that actually makes skill development happen in an empowering way. Participatory, it's not just sit and get, it is uh, people are contributing in a meaningful way and repeatable. It's something that you do um, over and over again, whether that be weekly, monthly, um, or some other time span. Well, that is where we're going to leave it because we cannot repeat this. Although you will have the opportunity to watch <laughs> it again online on demand if you wish. But Kevin, thank you so much. Thanks to your mom for what she's doing. I come from a family of folks in the healthcare space too. So I know it's been an especially difficult year. Last couple of months really feels like people are punching down on all the folks who are sitting in hospitals just doing their darndest after what's already been far too much. So thoughts and prayers and, and great gratitude to you and congratulations because we didn't talk about and we'll leave it mostly here unless people want to put shouts out in the chat. And that is that you're planning a wedding. You have a hot, talk about optimistic, happy things, right? Yeah. Well, I had a wedding scheduled for May and then it's been postponed. So I, I but the have, intention is there. You're yeah, yeah, I have 75% of a wedding already planned that just, you know, I've got the, I've got the project management boards and everything just waiting for me to pick it back up. <laughs> Uh, but yes, and I'm so glad to be, you know, quarantined with a life partner. Well, I am, I am grateful to you. We all are. You've done a tremendous amount of good for a tremendous number of good people. And for that, we are grateful. And we're looking forward to continuing to get to learn and work for, with you. So, Kevin, thank you very much. Everybody else, please be safe and well. This uh, kind of concludes V+, Plus, with the exception of... Uh, to Kevin's point, we are going to continue to gather regularly. So in the next two weeks, the next two Fridays, we are going to have group discussions and maybe you've already signed up for them, in which case I'll see you soon. But we're going to have a conversation this Friday that's focused on how are you planning for 2021? What are you thinking about? What are some of the things that are on your mind? We'll get a group of us together to talk about that. And then next week, a little bit more of a global conversation. We're going to have a conversation about what are some of the obstacles and opportunities that we can kind of see through a crystal ball as we start to look into 2021 and how might those impact our work. So we'll get the benefit of hearing what other people are seeing from where they sit. And, and that's all coming ahead this Friday and next Friday. If you want or need an invite for that, just shoot me or carry an email. We'll be happy to get back in touch and get you hooked up there. Kevin, again, thank you so much. You've done a tremendous amount of good for, for the team and I and all our community ambassadors and also all these folks who are with us today. So we are incredibly grateful. All right, everybody, be safe and well. Marva, Michelle, thank you so much for your help. And Mr. T, as ever, much appreciated. Thank you, thank you. Thursday, sorry, Thursday for the group discussion. <laughs> this Thursday and Friday. Thank you, Carrie, for making me honest. See y'all.